It's half past eight. Half past eight. It's half past eight, New York time. Time to wake up America and stump the experts. Each week at this time, Lucky Strike offers you a panel of four experts, an MC, and a lot of questions and answers. You furnish the questions, and our experts try to answer them. For every question used, Lucky Strike will reward you with $10 in defense stamps. If the question is muffed, you get a total of a $50 defense bond plus the 24-volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Send your questions to Information, Please, 480 Lexington Avenue, New York City. If our editorial staff edits your questions a bit, don't fret over it. In case of similarity, we'll have to be sole judge of who shall be paid, and all questions become the property of Information, Please. Now light up a lucky strike as I present our Master of Ceremonies, book reviewer of the New Yorker magazine, Clifton Fadiman. Mr. Fadiman. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight as ever, information please proceeds in its spontaneous and happy-go-lucky manner. Our board of authorities includes two of our regulars, Franklin P. Adams and John Kieran, plus a couple of ghouls who at the present moment are trying hard to hypnotize your Master of Ceremonies, possibly with some success. They are first John Carradine, one of Hollywood's very best menaces, and Boris Karloff, the veteran bogeyman of the films and now number one blood curdler in arsenic and old lace. And by the way, Mr. Karloff, uh, since we have had to announce that you were scared to appear on uh, Friday the 13th last week, you're curdling much less blood in this country than you were before. <laughs> you realize that your reputation is practically zero at the moment. I made a mistake, Mr. Fadiman. You mean you should have appeared? I meant the 20th. Oh, you're scared? <laughs> 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 now see if we can make that come true, Mr. Karloff. I uh, suppose we start with a question from Paul Rosenbluth of New York City. Uh, in deference to our monstrous guests this evening, we start off with a question about victims of one sort or another. You're going to get two out of three on this if we can. I want you to identify for us a victim of treachery, in fact or in fiction, who uh, in this first case was shot in the back of the head. A victim of treachery who was shot in the back of the head. Mr. Karloff? I think that would be Jesse James. It uh, was Jesse James. Who shot him, Mr. Carradine? Uh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, we've never had it more pleasantly explained. Uh, what was your, your fictional name in the play, Mr. Carradine? Bob Ford. Uh, Robert Ford, yes. Dirty Little Coward. That's Bob the fellow. Mr. Howard. <laughs> now, now, we want... See Jesse James in his grave. Yes, we want to have as much... Uh, friendly badinage, Mr. Adams, as we can on this program. Also, Carradine is a darn sight bigger than you are. Uh, Mr. Karloff, have you, in the course of your grim career, ever done any uh, backstabbing? I don't never. mean on this program. Never. You never have? Never. <laughs> Much more virtuous than you are, Mr. Carradine. How about this one? A victim of treachery who was killed by a treacherous letting of blood. His blood was let. Uh, Mr. Carradine. No, I beg your pardon. No. Uh, that isn't in your uh, biography, eh? Uh, Mr. Karloff, doesn't it appeal to you? Yes, it does. I wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the famous story of Robin Hood. Remember when Robin Hood was ill at the end of the book? He was put in the care of a prioress who was really his enemy, and she uh, slit his veins and just let him bleed quietly to death, a very affecting death. Uh, that was the death of Robin Hood. Not a bad notion, eh, Mr. Carla? Fine. Yeah. Now, uh, in this case, the victim was killed with a poisoned rapier. Killed with a poisoned rapier. Mr. Uh, Kieran. Well, that was uh, Hamlet and Laertes, both. Hamlet and Laertes, both of them killed with a poisoned rapier. Very good. Mr. Carradine, you were going to say the same Why thing, I have no doubt. That gives us two victims out of three. How about this one from Irwin Fisher of Baltimore? Uh, we ended with a Shakespearean reference. Let's start with another. Now, I'm going to give you situations from three Shakespearean plays. You are to quote from the famous speech made in each case. I'll explain each case. Now, this is Act Three, Scene Four of Hamlet. Hamlet is showing his mother the picture of two kings, and he's comparing them. What does he say? Mr. Carradine. See what a grace was seated on this brow. Yes. My period and curl, the front of Job himself. That's very I good. I like Mars to threaten and command. Very, Go very on. good. An amazing repertory, Mr. Carradine. <coughs> Hope Hollywood's listening in. What were you going to say, Mr. Adams? Same thing. Same thing, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Less well. <laughs> Mr. Kieran. I can go on from there for a couple of lines. All right. A station like the Herald Mercury, new lighted on a heaven-kissing hill. Is that all right? A dandy. How's that, Mr. Carradine? Oh, it's fine. Okay. A combination of the form, indeed, whatever he got in the scene. <laughs> <laughs> 
Shall we just go on with the play? Uh, yeah, we'd better get off Shakespeare sooner or later. How about uh, Othello? In this case, Iago is discussing Cassio's character with Othello, and he hesitates at besmirching Cassio's name. Do you remember that? What does he say? This is in Act 3, Scene 3. Mr. Kieran. Who steals my purse, steals trash? That's the famous speech, yes. Very good. How does it begin? There are a couple of lines before that. Remember it, uh, Mr. Carradine? I thought you had your hand up um, there. Good name. Good name of man or woman, dear my lord, is the immediate jewel of their soul. Who steals my purse, steals trash. I, I would like to explain to the listening audience that Mr. Carradine is not reading from a book. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, next one from Act 2, Scene 1 of Macbeth. Now here, Macbeth has just dismissed his servant. And he waits for the bell as a signal for his foul deed. Mr. Carradine had his hand up at once. He says to the servant, go bid thy mistress. When my drink is ready, she strike upon the bell. Get thee to bed. Yeah, I don't, want, I don't want the whole scene. <laughs> uh, <laughs> after no, the... he says it's after... a dagger which uh, I see before me, the handle toward my hand. Uh, Come, let good. me clutch thee. I have thee not. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I see thee still. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Adams, uh, I know my cues. You I? certainly <laughs> do. How about this one from W.H. Boggs of St. Louis, Missouri? Under what circumstances, again, either in fact or fiction, were these remarkable deeds performed? Yet three out of four. Now, this first deed, in this first deed, seven were killed with one blow. Under what circumstances? Mr. Adams. I think that's in the Grimm's fairy tale. Hmm? Uh, uh, the Brothers Grimm? The, yes, the like Brothers Caradine Grimm. Like Carradine and Karloff? Uh, a, uh, a tailor. Yeah, it's a tale. Flies. Yeah, flies. He made everybody believe they were men. Mr. Karloff, well, what were, were you in I was about else? to say that. Going to say that, yes. In fact, that was the name of the, of the, of the story, Seven and a Blow. Yes, that's right, Mr. Carradine. Still here? We've left Shakespeare, you know, Mr. Carradine. <laughs> <laughs> How about the one who killed 40 in a row? What are the circumstances under which that wholesale assassination was committed, Mr. Karloff? I think that was Alibaba and the 40 thieves, when yep. they were all in, uh, in jugs. In jugs, yes. And who did the killing? Um... Somebody's girlfriend, if I remember right. <laughs> well, I don't know. Don't pull a winchel on us. Mr. Carradine? Well, I can't remember her name, but she was the servant to, uh, to Aladdin's brother. And servant of Alibaba. Upon the death of his brother in the cave. Yes, yeah, servant of Alibaba. Was it Morgiana? Was that That's the name? It. Yes. How did she do the trick, Mr. Karloff? <laughs> did you say that? Uh, perhaps I wasn't listening. No, I didn't. Uh, how did she do the killing, uh, Mr. Carradine? She poured hot oil on them as they were waiting in the jars to get out and surprise Aladdin in the middle of the night. Yes, yes. I wish I could reproduce Mr. Karloff's grin. <laughs> Very good. And uh, now we have... We have uh, someone who... Uh, Killed 25 Germans single-handed and captured 132. Mr. Uh, we have three hands on that, Mr. Kieran. Well, that was Sergeant York. Sergeant York in the famous uh, Argonne in uh, 1918. How about someone who killed 116 Japs single-handed to bring uh, this thing perhaps a little more up-to-date? Mm. Killed 116 Japs single-handed. Uh, does that come back to you, gentlemen? Well, it's a famous story that's appeared... Uh, only recently. I think I'll have to give it to you. Well, wait a minute. Uh, Mr. Kieran? Uh, I've forgotten what uh, Tom Trapnell now. He blew up bridges of Bulkley, got, was uh, decorated for work out there. Well, you've named some of our heroes, but Colin you haven't Kelly named this was one. A, a third one. Shall I give it to you, Mr. Kieran? You'll have to, I guess. Uh, uh, Captain was... Arthur W. Wermuth of the 57th Filipino Scout Regiment, are responsible for the death of 116 Japs on Bataan Peninsula during the fighting going on there, and is uh, probably still at it, we hope. Well, that gives us uh, three out of four, I think. How about this, gentlemen, from Mrs. Catherine Stroop of Boston? This is a, uh, naturally coming from Boston, a much more cultural question. Get two out of three if you can. <laughs> can you quote the line which each of these repeated words occurs? Give us the whole line. <coughs> Keeping time, 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 Mr. Adams. In a sort of runic rhyme. Good enough. That's from what poem? The Bells. From The Bells. Uh, e. Bells. Po. Can you give us a couple of more lines after that? Keeping time, of, time, time. In a sort of runic rhyme to the tintinabulation that so musically swells and so forth, I am no boy that tell a whole play. <laughs> 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 I, uh, you'll find, Mr. Carradine, that Adams is pretty subtle on this one. Take a note of bitterness anywhere? <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's another set of repeated words. Riding, riding, riding. Uh, Mr. Kieran. The highwayman came riding, riding, riding over the purple moor, I guess. Yes, uh, came riding under several different circumstances, mm -hmm. up to the old indoor. Mr. Carradine, you, that came back oh, to I you, too? go on. He had a bunch of laces at his throat and a white cocked hat in his head. What do you think of that, Mr. Adams? <laughs> He's tough. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, here's a hard one. Those two were easy. Come, come. That's all I'm going to give you. Give me the whole line. Come, come. That's a, that's a <coughs> tough one, Mr. Well, Carradine. That's the lyric from a song by Victor Herbert. Sure. Oh, I know. Uh, how does it go? Come, come. Uh, I love you I love only. You only. I, I, uh, heart is true. I want you only. I long for you. Well, at least you're not singing it. That's something in your brain. Right? You don't know. Uh, that's very good. From the Chocolate Soldier. And there's a, a Shakespearean tag beginning with come, come, too. Mr. Carradine, this may be the only line you don't remember from Shakespeare. <laughs> Mr. Kieran, does it come back to you? It's from Hamlet. The Queen says, come, come, you answer with an idle tongue. Go, go, you question with a wicked tongue. Thank you very much, Mr. Carradine. <laughs> Give him an inch and he takes a mile. How about this one from Mrs. J.A. Potrickin of Alston, Massachusetts? By the way, you gentlemen have not been stumped yet, and it irks me. Who, in fact or fiction, was the famous child or family of these couples whose first names I'll give you? Get three out of four. Jalyon, J-O-L-Y-N, J-O-L-Y-O-N, Jalyon and Anne. Famous child or family of the of that couple. Uh, Mr. Carla. Soames Forsythe. Well, you have the right uh, family. You got the wrong man, I think. Soames uh, was the grandchild of them, ah. I think. What was the Forsythe family? It'd be young Jolly and Forsythe. Uh, yes, uh, th but the, the uh, progeny of Jolly and Anne were eight in number, I believe, and they were Jolly and Swithin, Timothy, Nicholas, Roger, Esther, Anne, and Hester. I guess that makes nine. And they were the famous Forsythe family, the older generation. How about uh, Elzir and Oliva? E-L-Z-I-R-E -E and Oliva, O-L-I-V-A. I may be mispronouncing those names. I hope not. Does anyone know the famous family produced by that couple? Ah, oh, gentlemen. They, well, they, they are the parents of the... Oh, yes. Dion. Dion. Very good, Mr. Quintuplet. Yes. Really? Yes, Dion Quintuplet. Uh, they also are the father and mother of a number of other children who, I believe... About 19. Well, more or less. Uh, <coughs> less known to fame. Now, how about Henry and Anne? Famous child or family, Henry and Anne. Produced, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Carradine. I'll take a little guess. Could Sorry. be uh, Edward the Sixth, could it? No. Son of Henry and Anne? Queen well, Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth, yes. Have to mark that wrong, though. Mr. Adams had it right, but a little too late. Queen Elizabeth, Henry VIII, of course, and Anne uh, Bullock. Now the famous child of Mrs. Jumbo. Mrs. Jumbo? Uh, Mr. Adams? Jumbo. Yes. <laughs> By the way, uh, Mr. Adams, where is Mr. Jumbo in this? I have no Mr. Jumbo listed on my card. Do you have any information as to Mr. Jumbo? I have, but not on this program. Very well. <coughs> <laughs> uh, next one from Anna Harrison Nelson of Kansas City, Missouri. <laughs> want you to name for me, if you can, gentlemen, three things which can be approached but never reached, as an example. An echo, I suppose, is might be uh, put under that listing. Something that can be approached but never reached. You may use your fancy on this, Mr. Adams. Zero and infinity. Well, you can reach zero, can't you? You can reach zero. Uh, you can... Uh, uh, infinity is, uh, for example, the place where parallel lines meet. Yes. Uh, I suppose that would be true. Infinity is something you can approach but never meet. How about another, Mr. Carla? You approach zero uh, as a limit if you divide, uh, keep on dividing an integer and keep on dividing... Uh, and keep on dividing. Yes, that's yeah. right. But, and, but you will never approach zero. That's true. You will approach it, but you will never you will reach it. it. Well, any, let's generalize by saying any mathematical limit. The theory uh, of limits. Isn't that uh, called absolute zero that you can't approach? Isn't that the correct name? I think it is. Just yes. plain zero. Carradine. Very good. We'll take absolute zero. Mr. Uh, Karloff. Uh, do you have another one? I mind? was wondering if he had in mind Miss Garbo. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very possible that Miss Garbo is not the only one that Mr. Adams can approach, but never read. Uh, I'll take Miss Garbo, Mr. Thank you. <laughs> if you can get her. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Kieran, did you have a... Uh, you have well, a congregation in your brow. Sunset and dawn. Sunset, that's very poetical. How, how do you mean that exactly? Well, you can approach sunset or you go toward right, walking it. Walking toward you it. Can't ever get I to it. That's true. Same uh, for dawn. Mr. Carradine? The end of a rainbow. Oh, yes. Pot of gold. Uh, yes, pot of gold, end of a rainbow. The uh, horizon. bottom of a live the volcano. Horizon. Mr. Carla, what were you saying? I was going to suggest the extreme bottom of a live volcano. What a nice idea, yes. <laughs> the extreme bottom of a live volcano. <laughs> well, that gives us a half a dozen things that can be approached but never reached. 
And so far, Lucky Strike has paid out no $50 defense bonds, and that means no sets of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now Mr. Cross, emulating the figure of justice, places fine tobacco in one scale and smoking enjoyment in the other. Yes, Mr. Fadiman, and I find that they're in perfect balance. The better the tobacco, the better the smoke. That's because in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. Fine tobacco gives you mildness, better taste, more smoking enjoyment all around. For this reason, the makers of Lucky's consistently pay the price to get the finer tobacco at market after market. For example, at auctions in Lumberton, North Carolina this season, the American Tobacco Company paid 31% more for the tobacco it bought for its cigarettes and other tobacco products. Yes, 31% above the average market price published by the United States Department of Agriculture. So it goes at market after market, and the best tobacco we buy goes into Lucky's. The result is Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Mr. Fadiman, doesn't that fact speak for itself? Mr. Cross, it says a lot and says it fast in just 52 seconds. And now we'll go on with a question from Kathleen Joyce of Detroit. This is about ants, A-U-N-T-S, famous ants of literature. I want you to name an ant who married an ant. An ant who married an ant. Mr. Kieran. Charlie's aunt. Yes, that's right. Charlie's aunt did marry an aunt. I think only in the moving picture version, though, in the play I, version. I don't remember it in the play, but... Did you see uh, Mr. J. Benny? Yes, I did. In the uh, movie version, well, there, he who plays uh, Lord Pankert Baberly does marry uh, his Spanish... Uh, the, the Spanish aunt, doesn't he? That's, that's right. quite right. How about an aunt who was also her nephew's mother? I believe that's perfectly clear. An aunt who was also her nephew's mother. <coughs> a little bit mixed up, I know. Any idea? I mean, it was his real mother, not acting as his mother. Uh, she wasn't uh, his aunt. She was just an aunt, wasn't she? She was an aunt of his. Not uh, just an aunt generally, but a, his own aunt. In other words, the nephew's aunt was also his mother. I'll make it clearer. I'll say the nephew's mother was also his aunt, Mr. Adams. Now, does it come to you? No. Nope. It's, well, uh, Mr. Kieran? Is that in uh, David Copperfield? No, no, no I don't know how to make that up. Well, now, come, come. It's Gertrude in Hamlet. Isn't his aunt also That's his right. mother? That's right. Uh, she marries uh, his uncle and therefore becomes his aunt. Well, and she's also his stepmother. Yes, yeah, she's also his stepmother. She gets three salaries, which is contrary to equity ruling. <laughs> That's right. Well, I have to count that wrong, gentlemen. Well, she's, she's not really his aunt. Oh, yes. No. Yes, and when he gets tired of calling her mother, he can call her aunt. He, she well, aunt is, is one's he... father's sister. Not necessarily. Not Sue necessarily. Shakespeare. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and let's know how you make out, Mr. Carradine. <clears throat> how about an aunt who announced she was in town? An aunt who announced she was in town, Mr. Adams. Aunt Jemima. And no less, yes. <laughs> what was Aunt Jemima's slogan? Eyes in town, honey. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, that gives us two ants out of three. Now, how about this? This is from Richard Kelly of New York City. It's about famous slaves. Who is the famous slave of each of these masters? Prospero had a slave. Mr. Carradine. Caliban. Caliban. I had three or four hands up on that. I guess we all knew it. Uh, Agamemnon had a famous slave. Agamemnon. Ah, not so many hands this time. Mr. Kieran. Briseis? No, I think you're thinking of... Uh, Briseis was the slave he of what? Slave. Slave? Roman Cressida? No. Well, no. I give up. Oh, uh, wait a minute. No, have no to count you wrong. Cassandra. Cassandra was given to Agamemnon as a slave. Remember that? Wasn't she the daughter of one of the kings? She was the daughter of one of the daughters of Priam. He who wasn't in those slave. days. She had 50. Right. Pardon, Mr. Carradine? Yeah, she became a little more than a slave to him. Oh, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> she did become a little more than a slave. <laughs> but she worked her way up, Mr. Carradine. She began <laughs> as a slave. Mr. C is kind of plain spoken. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, a famous slave of Augustine Sinclair? Uh, Mr. Adams. Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom, yes, very good. And Mr. Kieran had his hand up, too, on that. But we got two slaves out of three. Now, how about this from Mrs. L.A. Sander of St. Paul, Minnesota? Get three out of four. It's all about spiders. No doubt, uh, favorite pets of Mr. Karloff and Mr. Carradine here. Can you identify the spider who tried to be companionable? Well, that's Mr. Karloff. Uh, the spider with Bruce. 
Oh, uh, nothing companionable Bruce about of Scotland. Nothing companionable about that spider, I shouldn't think. Well, he has to let himself down on a thread to visit him, and that sort of encouraged Bruce to try <laughs> to escape. <laughs> yes, Mr. Adams? Uh, the spider attempted to be companionable with the celebrated fly. Oh, I think oh, you've all got wow. the wrong spiders, to my mind. Uh, he Mr. asked him to walk into his parlor, and nothing is more companionable than that. <laughs> Now, Mr. Adams and Mr. Karloff, you are going to mess up this question between you in a way which you can drive me nuts. Mr. Chardine? Why, the spider who got very companionable and sat down beside Miss Moffat. Yes, you are aware of Miss Moffat, Mr. Adams. That was the one, the spider who sat down beside Miss Moffat. Mr. Chardine, will you please answer all the rest of these? <laughs> now, identify the spider that persevered and saved a nation. <laughs> uh, Mr. Karloff? That's my chat with Bruce. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Now you're all right. <laughs> That's right. What was the story, Mr. Carlock? Remember it? Uh, the spider used to let himself down, and the thread would break, and so he'd try again and try again and try again, and Who that would? gave Bruce the idea yeah. of trying again. Yes, that. That's right. And he was successful in doing what? What was Bruce's aim? He, he freed Scotland from England. Well, yes, a good uh, stab at after the seventh time, the seventh try. Yep. Now a spider, a gentleman, that tried to be hospitable. Mr. Mm -hmm. Adams? That's my friend. <laughs> a friend for each of you boys on the program this evening, yes. That's the one who walked into my parlor. Will you walk into my parlor so the spider to the fly? Who wrote that? Anon. I have any idea. Remember, Anon. Was it our old friend Anon? I'm not sure. <laughs> now, who was so. called? I think, I think it was uh, a real person? actually authored by somebody. I think it was too. escapes me. It escapes <laughs> me too. A double escape. How about this one? Who was called a bottled spider and a bunch-backed toad? Have uh, two hands. Mr. Kieran? Richard the Third. Richard the Third. Very good. Uh, who called him that? Well, I'll give that to Mr. Carradine. Mr. Carradine? Margaret called him that. How many lines do you want to give us, Mr. Carradine? <laughs> I'll let it go at that. Right. <laughs> that gives us three spiders <laughs> out of four. By golly, we've got all our answers on the first part of that question. Here's one from P. Joseph Lamana of Brooklyn, New York. And gentlemen, if you don't mind, I should like to lose a $50 defense bond before this evening is over. Here are some questions on hanging, gentlemen, just to introduce a note of cheer into the <laughs> uh, What shall, quote, neither night nor day hang upon his penthouse lid? Close quote. Question mark. Mr. Kieran. Sleep. Very good, Mr. Kieran. That's not a very uh, well-known quotation. What's it from? That's what I'm trying to think of Mr. right Carradine. away. I bet. Adam. That's right. what witch is said. That's very it. good. Want to say any more, Mr. Carradine? No. All right. I'm not a witch tonight. <laughs> <laughs> How about this? What is hanging breathless on thy fate? Mr. Adams. Uh, union. No, it's another uh, abstraction. It's uh, a ship of state. Uh, that's uh, the reference. Uh, but what is doing the actual hanging? Mr. Carradine. Humanity, ah, with all its good. fears, with all its hopes of future years. Yes. Is hanging breathless on life. Yes, that's very good. <laughs> uh, Miss Carradine, what's the name of the poem that you're quoting? Uh, Mr. Well, Mr. Adams, the ship of state, I believe. No, uh, that's, we sort of the think ship. of it as that. The building of a the ship. The building of the ship. ship. Yes. That's right. Build me time. straight, O worthy master. You want any more of that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And gentlemen, finally, who hung by his nose up above? Who hung by his nose up above, Mr. Kieran? The man on the flying trapeze. Very good. That's right. I thought he hung by his knees. No, he hung yeah, by, by his, his nose. Hung by his nose. Anybody That's... could hang by well, his nose. the greatest knees. of knees, you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> That's three hangings out of three. <laughs> A little joculous evening, Mr. Adams, huh? How about this Nothing one? Nothing from... for me. <laughs> How about Albert Morland, uh, Morland's question? This comes from Montreal, Canada. Identify these kings of fact or fiction. Now, the first was a ship's captain who was called King Tom. King Tom, a ship's captain. Mr. Karloff, was that your hand going yes, up in that ghostly um, way? Yes. From the outcast of the island. Would you stop snapping those head. bones of yours? <laughs> <laughs> uh, big part. You see, his saying? name is Lingard. Very good. Who was uh, Captain Tom Lingard? Uh, he's in The Outcast of the Islands by Conrad and in Alma's Folly by yes. Conrad. Is he, is he in The Rescue, too? And in The Rescue. And in The Rescue. But years later. Yes, uh, very good. That uh, only a, a uh, omnivorous Conrad fan, I think, would get. Mr. Cowding, would you care to quote uh, one of the novels of Conrad <laughs> for us? How about the king who owed his throne to a girl? Owed his throne to the efforts of a girl. Mr. Carla. Um... King Charles of France owed yes. his throne 
To whom? To Joan of Arc. Yes, to Joan of Arc. Very good. She got the dolphin crowned as Charles the Seventh after the siege of Orleans. Very good, Mr. Carlock. Now, how about the king who slid down the banister? King who slid down the banister, Mr. Adams. That was in the king's breakfast. It was in the king's breakfast. Could you give us a line? By Alan A. Milne. Yes. Uh, Mr. Kieran, does it come back to you? Yes. King asked the queen and the queen asked the dairymaid, how about some butter for the royal slice of bread? <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't got him sliding down the banister yet. Oh. Though. Yes. Uh, certainly nobody the king said. said. Nobody said as he slid down the banisters. Uh, nobody. Nobody, he said, could fu- call me a fussy man. Something but like I that. But I do like a little bit of butter with my bread. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I couldn't stump you on that one, gentlemen. Now here's a question for Mr. Cross. Why is it worthwhile for everyday smokers to follow the advice of tobacco experts? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's because the independent tobacco experts down south watch each sale at the auctions. It's their business as auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen to scrutinize and examine the leaf. And because the sales take place on the open market, they see just who buys what tobacco and the price is paid. That's why their overwhelming preference for one cigarette, Lucky's, means a lot to you as a smoker. For at market after market, these experts see us pay the price to get the finer, milder, better-tasting tobacco. For example, at auctions in Brookneal, Virginia this season, the makers of Lucky's paid 26% above the average market price published by the United States Department of Agriculture. At Aberdeen, North Carolina, 35% more, and so on all over the South. The result is, lucky strike means fine tobacco. Smokers, it's clear that in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. So surely it's worth your while to smoke the cigarette that has won the overwhelming approval of the independent tobacco experts. Lucky strike. Thank you, Mr. Cross. I can quite truthfully say this evening that lucky strike has cheerfully paid out no $50 defense bonds and no sets of the encyclopedia. Thanks very largely to the brilliant supplementary efforts of our two monsters this evening. Uh, whom, by the way, Lucky Strike wishes to thank Mr. Karloff, the villainous Mr. Karloff, and the no less villainous Mr. Carradine for being so villain this evening. Now, next week, our three regulars, Levant, Kieran, and Adams, will be on deck, and we'll have as our very extra special guest the distinguished literary figure, Emil Ludwig, whom you'll all know as the biographer of Napoleon and as perhaps uh, soon to be known as the author of the forthcoming book, The Mediterranean. Remember, for every question that's answered correctly, the sender gets $10 in defense stamps, and for every question that stumps our board, you get a total of a $50 defense bond, plus the complete 24-volume set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. 